A few years ago, we were living in Sri Lanka, and my wife came in to talk to me, and I could tell that she was about to request something or talk to me about something uh, that I could just tell she was a little uneasy about it. And she came in and she explained to me that outside of the gate, you know, in Sri Lanka, you have houses and you have these large gates and walls that right outside of the gate uh, of our house, she found these kittens. And you can put that first slide up. Uh, She found these kittens that had just been born and something had happened to the mother and the mother had died or been taken away or whatever. And so she came to me. And, and she wanted to ask me if we would be willing to just keep them long enough to kind of get them out of the danger zone, just kind of nourish them up and then, you know, get rid of them in a, in a proper way. Now, she knows that I am allergic to cats physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every possible way that you can imagine. And I am anti-cat. And, and, and honestly, she herself is not a lover of cats. She doesn't want cats. And, and so, but she came to me and she said, I, I just can't leave these little kittens out there knowing that they're going to die. And I was thinking, well, it's a good thing that I wasn't the one that found it first. But anyway, and so she came to me and she said, I, I can't do that. And so she, she said, look, if we could just keep them for X amount of weeks and that's it. We'll just keep them this amount of weeks. And then once we've got them, you know, past that weaning stage, then we can take them to someone or take them to a family or take them to a village and, and have someone take the kittens. Uh, and, and that'll be good. Now, now what she was requesting made sense. Objectively, like I knew it was fine. She wasn't asking to put the kittens in the house because that would have definitely been no We had a large yard and I knew what she was asking objectively was right and made sense. You know, here are these little kittens. If we don't do something with them, they're going to die. We bring them in, keep them for a few weeks, you know, nourish them up and then we, we can put them somewhere. But here's what I know that that may sound good objectively, but that's not probably how this is going to go. Because those little scruffy little cute, those little kittens are going to grow a little bit. And as much as I hate kittens, they get a little cute. Go to the next picture. And this is one of them. They get these little cute little eyes and this little look. And here's what I know, that kittens are cute and kittens are cuddly. And I've got little kids and I've got little Caitlin and she's going to start playing with these little kittens and feeding the little kittens and spending time with the little kittens. And here's what's going to happen at the Hetzer house. They're going to get emotionally attached to these things. And once they get emotionally attached with them and feeding with them and playing with them, and, and, you know, I tried to say we can't name them. We've got to call them number one and number two, you know. Once they start naming them, they're going to get emotionally attached to them. And here's what's going to happen. When you get emotionally attached to something, you lose objectivity. You see, you go into something and you think, oh, this is what this is the right thing to do. We'll just do this for a couple weeks. But here's what I know that you get around them. You see the little cute little kitty eyes. You get emotionally attached to something. And the next thing I know, I'm going to have a daughter crying and saying, Daddy, can we keep the kitties? Can we keep the kitties? And I know that I'm going to start getting this pressure and all reason, all common sense, all wisdom, all knowledge is going to go out the window because they're going to get emotionally attached. And when we get emotionally attached to something, we lose objectivity. In In John chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, notice this, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So here is Nicodemus. He comes under the cover of darkness, under the evening sky, and he meets with Jesus Christ. Nicodemus is a religious man. He is a a very esteemed religious man, a, a Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus Christ. And here's what he says, objectively watching you, observing you, listening to you, 
seeing who you are, we know you're of God. By the way, can I just say this? Anyone who observes Christ, reads the Gospels, takes time to truly analyze the person and teaching and miracles and powers of Jesus Christ will objectively come to that same conclusion that Jesus Christ is not just a man. He is not just a prophet. He is not just some great teacher, but he is of God. He is divine for there were attributes of him that no one else had. And so he comes and he explains that. And then what he does is he just kind of says, basically, tell me what I need to know. Jesus, through the gospel of John chapter three, begins to talk to him and he explains to him that in order for him to enter into the kingdom of heaven, his religion will not do. That if he seeks to enter into the kingdom of heaven and pass from this life into life eternal, that, that something else must happen to him besides relying upon his religious works. That just as he was born physically to enter into the physical kingdom, he must be born spiritually to enter into the spiritual. That just as he was born of the flesh physically to interact and be a part of earth, that he too must be born spiritually and have the Spirit of God give him life to give him access to the spiritual world of the kingdom of heaven. And he explains that that spiritual birth only comes by believing and calling upon Jesus Christ. I want to just stop and say this this morning, that for those who receive Jesus Christ today, for those who came to church and and recognized that they needed to have their sins forgiven and they needed to to have salvation and they called upon Jesus Christ. I want to say this, that not only did they have their sins forgiven, not only did they talk to the Lord, but they were born spiritually. That when they walked out these doors, if you're here and you were saved this morning, you walked out of here not just forgiven, but you walked out of here a new creation. The Spirit of God is in you, and now He will guide you, and now He will empower you, and now He will give you the ability to understand Scripture, and the ability to know God, and to live in the spiritual realm with spiritual power. When you you get saved, you do more than get a transaction. You get a life transformation by the Spirit of God. And so, as Jesus is saying all this, get this, Nicodemus knows everything he's saying is true. His heart is saying, I know he is of God. Objectively, he is hearing the Lord. He is hearing this gospel. He is hearing the reality that that not only must he be born physically, but he must be spiritually. And he knows in his mind that this is true objectively, but get it, but this is a hard thing for him to do. Why? Because he has become emotionally attached to something. Because in, in the process of his life, he has become emotionally attached to the darkness. The darkness, it it, it illustrates a couple things. One, it illustrates the state of being away from God, outside of the presence of God, the guidance of God, and the Word of God. It also speaks of the actions of committing sins and doing things against the Word of God. And Nicodemus, though he was a religious man, Nicodemus, though he had observances and laws, get this, he, religion kept him away from God, outside of God. And he used his religion to allow him to enjoy and indulge and engage in a lot of things that were against God. And in the process of Nicodemus's life, He became emotionally attached to a life outside of God. He became emotionally attached to the darkness. And even though he could hear Jesus and look at Jesus and know you are of God and you are true, it was hard for him to turn to Jesus Christ because he loved or because he had an emotional attachment to the darkness. And Jesus, knowing that, knowing that Nicodemus is actually going to reject him in this particular moment and not receive him yet, Jesus, knowing that, is going to explain and expound upon this emotional attachment that Nicodemus has. And he explains how it works, 
And in doing so, he has some things for you and for me to understand. He says this in verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men, notice this, loved darkness. Jesus explains this, that as man lives outside of God, as man lives away from his presence and his guidance and his word and his instruction, that living in the darkness begins to work in man in such a way that man becomes emotionally attached to darkness and begins to love it. What makes, what makes someone love darkness? Let me give you some. One, there is perceived freedom in darkness. You see, when you have no God and you have no commands and you have no truth, you are free to live however you want. You can do what you feel, you, you can say what you want to say, and there's a sense of liberation. There's a sense of liberation in not having to follow God or obey God. And so people love the freedom and the liberty to be able to do and go and enjoy and indulge in whatever things they want. The darkness feels easier. Look, when you don't have a standard, when you don't have a, a, a word of God, or you don't have a, a standard of holiness that you're trying to meet, you can set your own standard. You can set your own boundaries and that is a much easier life to just do what feels good to you and you to determine what's right and you to determine what's wrong. The truth is this, darkness feels good. You know, there's aspects of darkness in the immediate that are enjoyable. No, no, the Bible says so. That, that sin is pleasant for a season. That there's a pleasure to it, that, that in darkness there are experiences and environments and physical pleasures that people enjoy doing. Listen, if sin wasn't pleasurable, people wouldn't do it. The darkness is popular. You know, there's a lot more people in the darkness than there is in the light. That the darkness is where most people live. The darkness, living in the darkness, it's easy to fit in. The darkness is where most people at your job. The darkness is what most people at school. The darkness is what most people in society are in. So it's popular. So if you're in the darkness, you've got a friend all around because most people around you are in the darkness. Perhaps most importantly, the darkness makes us dark. You see, when you and I get in darkness and we begin to indulge in sin and, and disobey the Lord and do things our own way, that darkness attaches to us and it changes us. It darkens our conscience, it darkens our mind, it darkens our thoughts, and suddenly our heart begins to get dark, our heart begins to attach to and become more like, and our thinking and our actions and our appearance and everything about us begins to be controlled and dictated, and the more we're in the darkness, guess what? The more we become darkness. And so all of those things, the freedom and the fact that it feels easier and the pleasure and the popularity and the darkness working in us, those things make us become attached to where people may not know this, people may not express this, but the reality is we come to love the things of the darkness. We love our freedom. We love those pleasures. We love those liberation. We love being part of the crowd and being accepted by others. We love to indulge in those things. And that affection is powerful. How powerful? Get this. It's powerful enough to cause us to override what we know objectively is true. Notice what he says in verse 19. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil, notice, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So Jesus says this, that when someone's in darkness and they're indulging in the darkness and engaging in sin or living outside of God, whether they're living in a more, trying to live morally or religiously, when they're away from God, over time that attachment becomes so strong that when light comes, Jesus comes, righteousness comes, holiness comes, the, the manner of living for God comes, Man sees it, and here's what they do. Because they're so in love and attached to darkness, they hate the light. They don't want the light. 
They buck against the light. The light is, it, it, it annoys them. It bothers them. It irritates them. They, they, they don't want anything to do with it. They flat out detest it or they find it something that's boring or something that they can't enjoy. Why? Because light exposes darkness. Light shows this is wrong and this is wrong. And we're saying, no, 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 I don't want you to touch this. No, 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 I don't want to lose this. So we hate the light because the light wants to remove the darkness that we love so much. Jesus knew that Nicodemus was sitting there looking at Jesus, listening to Jesus, knowing everything he's saying is true, everything he's saying is right, but Nicodemus at this point is going to walk away without salvation. And you know why? Because he loved darkness and he didn't want the light to take away his religion. He didn't want the light to take away his esteem. He didn't want the light to take his popularity. He didn't want the light to take away his ability to pray and also live in sin. He did not want the light to take away way the life that he had in the darkness you know light can become so strongly attached to you and me that we don't want the light no we can know that Jesus is true we can know that the Bible is right we can know that this is the true way but we get entrenched in sin we get entrenched in a lazy way or a sinful way or an indulgent way and we become attached to it and when light confronts us when a message confronts us when the gospel confronts us when truth confronts us even though objectively we know we should do it we won't go to it we don't want it why because we have become emotionally attached to the darkness. You know, many people reject Christ not because they don't believe in Jesus, but because they love the darkness more. Now, there, there are many people, you know why many people in our society hate Christianity, why they despise Christianity? They're, they're not against Buddhism. They're not against Hinduism. They're not against a lot of other religions. Do you know why they're against Christianity? Because Christianity shines a bright light on their sin. Christianity shines a bright light and says this lifestyle and this manner of life is not okay and it is not right. And they get angry and they lash out and they want to shut down Christianity and they don't want Christ in the workplace and they don't want Christ in the school and they don't want people to be able to talk about the Lord on the internet or on YouTube. Why? Because it's exposing the darkness and the evil that they love. Now Christians, we need to understand the power of darkness because we live in a world that is, there is darkness everywhere we turn. Listen, all in your house, if you have any kind of electronics in your life, if you work in the secular field, if you go to a secular institution, all around you and all around me are invitations of darkness. And here is where we get fooled. We trick ourselves into thinking we can have a little bit of this over here or we can have a little bit of this over there. And as long as I'm in church and as long as I'm doing this and as long as I'm doing that, a little bit of this entertainment's not going to hurt. A little bit of this music's not going to hurt. A little bit of this social media is not going to hurt. A little bit of these friendships isn't going to hurt. And we minimize, we minimize the power and the allurement of darkness in our life. No, people don't, Christians don't get away from God on day one and say, you know, I'm just going to fall in love with the world and drop out of church and get all bent out into sin. That's not what happens. You know what, how it happens? It happens like my wife came to me and said, now, I know that you don't like, we can't keep the cats, but we can have them for a little period of time. That's how you and I get ourselves into trouble with darkness. We say, you know, what's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this over here, and we minimize, and we allow the darkness in our life, and we allow ourselves to have some hidden pleasures, or some hidden indulgences, or we go to work and we allow ourselves to behave a certain way, or talk a certain way, or act a certain way, and here's what we do, we underestimate that if you bring those kittens in your house, you're going to fall in love with them, and you can't always control that. You can't just listen. You let your kids get in the world. You let your kids get, get the world in them. You can't just always preach it right out of them. You don't guard. If you don't monitor, if you don't pay attention to this darkness, this darkness will steal your heart. And when we love the darkness, do you know what happens? 
Let me tell you what happens to a Christian who loves the darkness. They stop enjoying reading their Bible. They struggle to pray. They don't enjoy preaching as much. No, they, they, they were back in the day, they used to have preaching on in the car. They used to have church music on in the car. Man, that was a great sermon. They were all fired up. And now they hardly ever listen to preaching. Now they hardly ever listen to godly music. They got all, other, all kinds of stuff on their Amazon music or on their Spotify music. None of it is really godly. None of it is really holy. They go to read the Bible and it's almost like, man, this is hard and, and I don't really enjoy this. And you know what, you know what that is? That's darkness. Working in us. Carnality. Working in us changing our affections and making us not want the light. Why? Because the light exposes and says we can't coexist together. Either you will have light or you will have darkness. And we don't even realize it sometimes, but we slowly, continually gravitate towards the darkness and we watch the light get suffocated out of our life. Look, if you're finding yourself not enjoying but reading your Bible, you need to check the darkness you find your children not having an appetite for church, not having an appetite for the things of God. You find, you find in, your, in your home joking about things that there shouldn't be joking about or making light of the things of God. You need to take a good look and analyze if there's some darkness in your life, if there's some darkness in your heart. You don't find yourself wanting to ever go to an altar, wanting to get yourself right with God, wanting to pursue him, wanting to live for him. You find yourself getting a little bit in indifferent, a little bit cold. Here's what you better check. You better check the darkness in your life because if that darkness begins to get a grip on you or get a grip on me, eventually we will choke out and we will not want the light in our life. So someone says, well, man, I mean, if, if someone gets the darkness, if there's a lost person and they're choosing the way of darkness and then they love the darkness and they hate the light, well, how are they ever going to get saved? So I might say, I mean, well, if, if I'm a Christian and, and I get away from, from the light and I start living in the darkness and, and I start allowing sin to get in my heart and all of a sudden now I'm in love with darkness, well, man, what's going to bring me back to the Lord? Well, notice what he says in verse 17. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned, notice this, already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is, you see this word a lot here, don't you? This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Now, now here's what I want you to get. When someone, first of all, that's lost, when they choose to embrace the darkness and go to the darkness, and they, listen, they're going to have their freedom, and they're going to have their pleasure, and, they, and it's going to feel easier, and they're going to have their popularity, and they're going to indulge in darkness, they're going to get all that. But listen to me, that's not all they get. See, when they choose darkness, they don't get to just have darkness with nothing else involved. Do you know what else they get? condemnation. The word condemnation means this, the judicial act of declaring one guilty and dooming him to punishment. You know, when someone outside of Jesus Christ chooses darkness and they do not choose Jesus Christ, they have layers of condemnation in their life. The first condemnation, the most important one is eternal condemnation. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you do not have Jesus Christ, you cannot come to God and you are under the condemnation. You are under the wrath of God. And when you stand before God and he judges you, you will be sentenced to eternal hell, eternal separation from him forever. So, so when you choose the darkness, that's part of the package. There's also spiritual condemnation. When you choose the darkness and you don't have Jesus Christ, you know what you also have? You don't have a relationship with God. 
When you don't have a relationship with God, there's no joy. There's no spiritual power. There's no peace. All of the spiritual qualities that our heart desires, love and joy and peace and the presence of God and the spiritual fulfillment that all of us are wired with, we don't have that. We have a spiritual condemnation that says, I am missing something. I do not have the presence of God. I do not have the favor of God. And so there's this eternal condemnation and this spiritual condemnation. But then there's also physical condemnation. Because you know what sin brings? James says sin brings death. And so when you start to live in darkness, it may feel good at first, it may seem fine at first, but that sin is going to bring death into your relationships. That sin is going to hurt your marriage. That sin is going to hurt your, your raising of your children. That sin is going to hurt your conscience and your emotional well-being. That sin is going to begin to bring death and pain and consequences and agony all over your life so that you're going to see issues in relationships and you're going to look at yourself and you're going to see these struggles and the internal battles. No, we see it all over the nation with health issues and mental health issues and emotional issues. That is not just something that, that just came on the scene. That is us trying to find a solution to the fact that there is this spiritual condemnation and physical condemnation of living outside of Jesus Christ. Christ. And so, so the person who rejects Christ, they say, oh, I'm going to have the darkness. I love the darkness. But here's what they also have. Condemnation. The judgment that's coming. The lack of God's presence. And then the condemnation of sin all over. Now for us as believers, praise God, we have no condemnation. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But there is chastisement. There is chastisement. And when you and I as believers, we begin to get into the darkness, you know what happens? God gets in our life and he begins to discipline us and he begins to correct us. And suddenly we know we begin to experience conviction and we begin to experience shame and we begin to experience guilt and we begin to experience this not spirit, not a salvation separation, but we feel the absence of the fellowship with the father and, and we begin to experience that and we see the consequences of our sin. Because while you may not be condemned as a Christian, you can still sow consequences as a Christian. And so you get in the darkness and you may say, I'm going to get a little breather from the Lord. I'm going to just enjoy this little over here. I'm going to have this little fright night thing or I'm going to have this little pocket of sin over here in my life and you think you've just got this darkness but now condemnation or, ch or chastisement is going to come and there's going to be consequences and guilt and suffering and pain to believers who get outside of the light but there's more than just the presence there's the knowledge of it because he says in verse 19, this is the condemnation that light has come unto the world and men love darkness rather than. In other words, when, when man chooses darkness, he is aware that he is making a choice. And in making a choice, he is aware that these consequences are coming from his choice. When someone rejects Jesus Christ, they know they've rejected Christ and they know that they have turned away the light. And though they love the darkness, they are aware that there is this judgment. They are aware that there are these penalties. They become aware that these consequences in this life are from their choice of living in the darkness. You know what happens to a believer? Believer gets away from God and they begin to experience suffering and they begin to experience consequences and they begin to have things internally in their life. You know what they know? They know this is because I'm away from God. They know this is because of this sin over here. They know it's because I'm not lined out with the Lord like I should be. And so there is this knowledge that this chastisement or for the lost, there is this condemnation in my life. Why? Because I'm holding on to this darkness in my life. So what happens with that? Well, verse 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Now I'm going to try to break the, the English of this, of this sentence. Is very, uh, it's, it's very unique, but I'm going to try to articulate this in a way that, that's clear. But here's what, here's what John is saying to us. Someone says, okay, so here, how does someone go from living in the darkness and loving the darkness to going to the light and receiving Jesus as Savior or as a Christian repenting of the darkness and turning back towards living in the light? There's two aspects to it. Here's the first step. 
A person wants to be free from condemnation more than they want to be in the sin. So, so okay, so we get the kittens. I, I said, fine. <laughs> and it's just a total love fest at my house. Like I wake up and it's just my kids and the kittens and they're drawing them. And I got pictures on the wall of kittens. It's just like kitten heaven at the Hetzer house. And I'm just like, ah, you know. But anyway, so they're loving it and it's going good. And my wife's, you know, taking pictures. And, and I, that was one of the pictures, you know, taking cute little pictures. And, you know, oh, aren't they so adorable? I'm like, no, they're not adorable. They're wicked and they're not made by God. But anyway, and, and, so, and so it's just going great. And they want to, and, and I can tell, like, because I'm, I'm pretty cold about this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, the day is coming. Like, like, just like the prophet Samuel, when he is weaned, we're taking him to the Eli and we're dropping him off at the temple. And, uh, and, so, and so I'm seeing, though, this, this, this connection and this love. And, and I'm tender because Caitlin really is enjoying the kittens. But... The kittens don't, the situation doesn't stay cute. Because we live, Sri Lanka is essentially a jungle. The jungle in the city of Colombo is carved out into a massive city, but we live in a jungle with vipers and, you know, rats the size of dogs and monkeys and all that kind of, I mean, it, it is a bona fide jungle with, with massive spiders. I mean, the whole deal. Okay, I got amazing stories, by the way. And these kittens are outside. And they're little teeny kittens. You know what happens when you have little kittens outside and you live in a jungle with a bunch of creatures? A lot of stuff starts showing up in your yard. A lot of stuff that you don't want in your yard around your children because they're not particularly safe to have around the house. And so things start happening around the house. And then you have stray cats. And I mean, just we got all kinds of action happening around our house. And, and, and it started off with one of the kittens dying. Yeah, and I'm not be honest. I mean, for as cold as I was, that was a really bad day in the Hetzer house. I mean, Caitlin was just bawling. The kitty had died. I had to, to, you know, get rid of the kitten. So now my wife is seeing the pain and realizing, man, we might lose all these kittens because we got all this stuff going on. And now all of a sudden they're stressed because we're going soul winning and we're going to church. And now we've got these kittens and we're leaving them in the yard. And what's going to happen? Are we going to come back to some massacre? And the kids are going to be, you know, forever, you know, you know, just forever tainted because they've seen these kittens all over the yard and stuff like that. And I, I mean, it's starting to really impact the, the life of the Hetzer Hound. They're stressed and we're worried about it. And all of a sudden, you know what happened? The joy of having the kittens was no longer bigger than the problem of having them. And the fear and the consequences and the stress and the strain of every time we were leaving, looking around and putting them in a spot and, and trying to lock the gates and try to position things where nothing happened and then coming home and pulling up and making sure that we don't run them over and then look around and all these different things. That stress and all of the anxiety and the problems and the, and the trauma that it was bringing to my kids, it became greater than the love fest. To where we began to, where my wife began to say, honey, I think we're okay to go ahead and remove these kittens. Here's what happens. When you and I live in the darkness, at first the darkness seems great. We have pockets, especially for a lost person, there's freedom, there's liberation, there's, there's what it does. And then even for, and even for many Christians who, who begin to mess around in the world and it kind of feels liberating, it feels exciting, there's, there's satisfaction in the flesh and all that. But you know what happens? Condemnation begins to work. Chastisement begins to work. Consequences begin to work. Penalty begins to work. And all of a sudden, this darkness begins to wreak havoc on our life. And we begin to feel this guilt and we begin to feel this shame and we begin to see what it's doing to us and we see what it's doing to our marriage and we see what it's doing to our children and we see what it's doing to our walk with God or we see what it's doing to our life. And many people outside of Christ, they begin to see death unfolding all around them and inside of them so much so that whether it's the condemnation or the chastisement, it becomes greater the enjoyment of being in darkness to where, it's, where we're not saying we love the light as much as we're saying, I don't like the darkness anymore. 
I want to say this, that if you're in some darkness right now and you've got hidden sin in your life, at some point, here's what's going to happen. That darkness is going to reveal itself and you're going to see that you hate it and you despise it and the, and the, and the, and the consequences and the addictions and the pain and the suffering and the shame and the guilt is going to work in you to such a way where you're going to realize, I don't want to be in the darkness anymore. Why do many people come to church? It's not so much that they're ready to live in the light. It's not so much that they love the light. Here's why many people go to church, because they look at their marriage, they look at their life, they look at their heart, and they say, I am tired of this. I have no joy. I have no peace. I have this guilt. I have this shame. And I want to get out of the darkness. Which leads to the second step, that as we welcome the light, and walk in the light, our love will change and our affection will change to being right with God. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth, so the person that's in the truth gravitates or chooses or wants to cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest. Why? because he wants to do things that are wrought of God. So the picture is this, that as someone comes out of the darkness and they begin to turn to light. Now, if they're outside of Christ, here's what that means. It means they realize that they have sin. They realize that the darkness is sin and the absence of God. And they realize what they need is God and they need their sin dealt with. And the way that you come to light is by coming to the person of light, Jesus Christ. And you come to Jesus Christ and you realize that he is the light. He is the one who brings forgiveness. He is the one who brings purity. He is the one who enables us to live in the light. And we call upon him and we trust on him and we come to Jesus and we have forgiveness of sins and the light of the spirit of God. And he enables us to now live in the light. For a believer, it's just coming back to Christ and repenting and saying, now I want to follow God again and I want to live in purity and I want to live in holiness and I want to forsake the path of sin that I'm in. Now, here's what happens. As you and I begin to walk in the light, we begin to realize the joy of the light. We see what the light makes us into, how it purifies us how it cleanses our mind, how it makes us Christ-like. It makes us someone that we're happy with. We see how God begins to speak to us and, and we hear the voice of God and, and God touches us and we begin to have this relationship with God and it's powerful and it's wonderful. We begin to make decisions in our life based upon the word of God and we see the wisdom of God's word and we see how it strengthens relationship and how it begins to sow health and life and good things in our life. And as we begin to walk in the light, do you know what happens? We love the light and we love being with God and we become emotionally attached to the light and so we want more light and more light and more light because there's nothing better than being in the light. Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. In other words, there's no condemnation. There's no chastisement in the light. There's no guilt in the light. There's no shame in the light. The joy of biblical friendships, the ability to have fun in the Lord. You, you go and do something as a church. You do something with church members in the Lord and you wake up the next day and you don't regret what you did the night before. You look in the mirror and you realize progressively every day that you're becoming becoming more gentle, you're becoming more loving, you're becoming more forgiving, that bitterness is being rooted out of you, that you're becoming a person like Jesus Christ and you love people and you're more selfless and you're less vain and you have less of a temper and you have less anger and you have less frustration in your life and you're looking at all this and now you're beginning to know who God actually is and talk to God and hear from God and you're thinking, mercy, I love the light, I'm coming to the light. I am enjoying the light. This is great. There is no sorrow in this. You see, some people are afraid to get saved because they're thinking, man, I'm going to get saved. I'm going to be bored. See, they think the light is this boring, you know, very sterile, very 
just, just, just a very stringent life. Hey, man, you know, this, this, this darkness is causing me some problems, but man, the light, wow, I'm afraid, you know, I'm going to have to wear a suit when I go to bed and, you know, <laughs> I got to start learning how to speak these and thous. And all. We start thinking it's just, you know, wow, this is just, no, no, no. But here's what we find when we come to Jesus Christ and we don't know a thing. No, I was there. We come to Jesus Christ and we don't know a thing. Here's what we find out. It, 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 it's, not, it's not stringent. It's not oppressive. It's not boring. It is joyful. It is wonderful. And we don't obey his commandments because we're being whipped. We love his commandments because we love him. And we obey his commandments because of the health and the breath that they bring to our life. And, and as we come into the light, we realize, man, this isn't boring. This is the greatest life and what is doing to me and my family and my relationships and, and all around me, we begin to realize there's nothing more joyful and greater than this. Some Christians need to get back to the light so your love will come back. See, the truth is you, you, you obey. The truth is that you do the things you're supposed to do, but you're not enjoying it because you have too much darkness in your life. And that darkness is choking out the pleasure and joy of living in the light. And you are halving it. You are, you are doing it by deed, but you are not doing it by heart. And there are some believers who need to say, I need to clean out some stuff. I need to purify some stuff. And it might not even be sinful stuff. It might just be a little bit too much of the news, a little bit too much of secular stuff that's just marring you and staining you. And you might just need to clear off some things and say, I'm going to jump all back into the light and inundate myself with word and inundate myself with holy music and inundate myself with the word of God and prayer and inundate myself with church people and good fellowship and church attendance and service and get back in. Here's what you're going to find. The Bible that's been cold, the Bible that you've been having a hard time reading, all of a sudden words are going to jump off the page and there'll be a flame of fire in your heart and praying where it just seemed like you were talking to the floor and you kept falling asleep all of a sudden it's like Jesus is supping with you and you with him and coming to church where it was like man I got to get out of here I got this to do today and I got that to do today you're thinking man the word of God is awesome and God is speaking and you're praying for souls and you're wanting to bring people and all of a sudden you're finding yourself wanting more light and wanting more light because your heart is inundated in the light of God Amen. you see Living in the light will make you glad you left the darkness. As long as you're in the darkness, it's hard to see. But as the chastisement or the condemnation begin to hurt you and it squeezes you and begins to bring you to the light, here's what you're going to find. I don't know anybody in my life, I have not met anyone preacher at the end of their life who said to me, I regret living a good Christian life. I, don't, I have not met one person yet sitting there at the hospice bed. and What are your reflections about life? And they say, I spent too much time with God. You laugh because you've never heard it either. Oh, I was just in church too much. You've never heard that. You only hear that when people are in the darkness. You know what you hear? You hear, man, I wish I would have had more of it. It was the best time of my life. And you know what they reflect upon? When you sit down with people at the end of their life, do you know what they reflect upon? They reflect, they reflect upon the times of their life where they were in the light. See, living in the light will make you glad that you left the darkness. A couple things. I mean, I want to kind of drive home a point your problem with the light is never the light. That's very, that is very important to get. When you find yourself at times where you're not enjoying the light, and you will find this, here's what you need to remember. Your problem isn't the light. Your problem is that darkness is in you somewhere. And it is becoming emotionally attached to you, and it's hindering your ability to enjoy the light. The light is always good. 
The light is always wonderful. The light is always a source of joy. It is only when darkness creeps in that we do not enjoy light. Number two, sometimes people must be ruined by condemnation before they will see the truth. I hate to say that. But you know, there are people who they want darkness and, and they're gonna have to go on a hard road until the darkness breaks them and takes from them. The Bible says that about the devil, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. And it is not until oftentimes people's lives have been plundered by the devil that they really begin to realize that God is everything they need in their life. I pray that believers do not have to be ruined by chastisement before they come back to God. Thirdly, I wanna say this. The Christian life truly offers perfect joy. I remember being a teenager and can I just be transparent? You know, you know, it's like you hear all the preaching about living for God and loving God. And there's just a part of me that always felt like, oh, I don't want to miss out on fun. Like, you know, I don't want to live a stuffy life. You know what the truth is? That was a lie of the devil. Because living in the light brings a clean, pure, sincere, exciting joy that cannot be experienced in any other way. And when you choose by faith to follow in the light, what you will find is a joy with no, it's not that there's not hard times, not that there's not consequences, but there is a purity that there is no sorrow in being in the light. I also would say this, the light is available for you today. Maybe you're here tonight and, and you're living in the darkness. What do you mean? I mean, you've never received Jesus Christ as your savior. You've never come to Jesus and called upon him and asked him to forgive you of your sins and committed your life to him and allowed him to bring the spirit of God into you. You've never been born of the spirit. So you're not a part of the spiritual kingdom. And so you're in darkness. You're separated from God. You're under the condemnation of God. You, you, are, you are facing eternal condemnation. You have spiritual condemnation. You are separated and you will have physical condemnation and the consequences of your sin. But here's what I wanna say. It doesn't have to be that way. There is light for you right here, right now in the person of Jesus. Amen. And all you have to do is come to him by faith and believe on him and call upon him and he will give you the light of salvation and the light of a knowledge of God and he will begin to work in your life and you will be forever free of condemnation. Light is available for you in trusting Jesus Christ. You come to the end of a revival and you'd say, you know, Brother Hetzer, what, what would be one of the thrusts that you would say tonight? And here's what I would say. Would to God we tonight in a wholehearted spirit and mind would say, I want to be pure of the darkness. I want to search, I want to search my life for the darkness. And I want to pursue with all that I have the light of God. Amen. To know him, to hear from him, to be more like him, to implement his truth and his commands in every facet of my life. I want to purge and purify myself and we should want to purge and purify ourselves of all darkness, confess all darkness and seek with as much ability as we can by the spirit of God to walk in the light as he is in the light. And my prayer is this, that as you come out of this meeting, that you will come out of this meeting saying, I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna clean the darkness in my home, clean any of the darkness in my life, and I want to, I want to wholeheartedly baptize myself in the light of God. Living in the light will make you glad that you left the darkness. May God help us to break free of the emotional attachments 
of the world and enjoy the glorious joy of the Lord.